When I first looked at rookie seasons, I knew it wasn't the end. Within the hundreds of housewives who have come and gone, there have been a lot of duds, but there have been so many more who have come on, made a splash, and changed the course of their show. Today, let's look at five more ladies who have entered the lion's den that is a first season as a real housewife, brushed off their hazing, and made housewives history. This isn't the last time I'll do this, so let me know who you want to see in the next installment. But without further ado, let's talk about five more amazing rookie performances, and just a heads up, these are not ranked. Let's start with two women who were just barely left off my initial list. Two women who totally invigorated their franchise. They're not exactly a duo, but it's hard not to talk about their legacy without mentioning the other, so I'm going to talk about them individually, then talk about the changes they made to their franchise together. I'm obviously talking about Jackie and Jennifer from New Jersey. Let's start with Jackie. So Jackie continued the trend Siggy and Margaret had established in the two seasons prior of non-Italian women joining the show. She came on knowing Melissa to some degree, and the two were fast friends. She tried to play it off as if she had no idea about the history between the women, but fans quickly sussed out that this wasn't true, that she was a super fan and had attended Teresa's book signings in the past. Jackie was unlike any housewife who had previously been on the New Jersey installment. She was an intellectual, a former lawyer who is now working as a journalist writing about parenting. She's kind of an elitist, or at least is accused of being one, as she flaunts her intelligence and education. She has an attractive husband and two sets of twins, which is crazy. Her family's interesting in that her parents are still together but live totally apart, and she has a sister she hasn't spoken with in years. She has a personal storyline of attempting to reconnect with her sister, though all we see are phone calls where we only hear Jackie's side, as her sister didn't want to be on camera. She also talks a lot about her struggle with anorexia and is very open and vulnerable about this. Where I think Jackie made the biggest splash was with the other women. Right off the bat, she made it clear she was Team Melissa and the mostly dormant feud between her and Teresa. The two had been bickering and having mini fights for the past few seasons, but after Teresa went to prison, everyone treated her with kid gloves and gave her a bit of a break. I think Melissa knew she was outnumbered in their war and decided it just wasn't worth it. Jackie changed all that by being a loyal ally to Melissa and not being afraid to go after Teresa. When Melissa and Teresa start sparring early on about Joe Gorga not spending enough time with his and Teresa's dad, Teresa blames Melissa and says she should have more control over her husband. Jackie thinks this is ridiculous and hypocritical given the Judices situation and points this out to Teresa. I'm sorry, all due respect, but you really feel like your husband would be in jail right now if you could control what he did. Given how much of a fan of the show she is, she has to have known how this was going to go. Of course, this is way over the line for Teresa, and she absolutely despises Jackie thereafter. Jackie also really got on with Margaret. I think both of them are smart, and they connected intellectually. Jackie also would hold Margaret accountable when she'd go too far, most notably on the cast trip to Cabo. Let's put a pin in this for now, as I think it's time we bring in Jennifer. So Jennifer also continued the branching away from the show's Italian roots as she was Turkish and her culture was a huge part of her identity. She's married to a plastic surgeon, Bill, and the two have five kids together. She lives a very lavish life and is not shy to tell people this. She rubs a lot of the women the wrong way, especially Margaret and Jackie, who find her to be a bragger and a one-upper. so beautiful. I have to say, I have a very similar sunset from my backyard. When Margaret takes them on a quick trip to Oklahoma, Jennifer finds a way to insult every aspect of the state, the accommodations, and the entertainment. Like, what is this? Is this like fun? It's like country music. What a f***ing snore. It definitely comes off as rude, but Jennifer was just trying to be funny. When she realizes how she was coming off, she apologizes. Teresa really takes to her, as does Danielle, mostly because Jen is feuding with Margaret, as is Danielle, so it's a bit of an enemy of my enemy situation. She finally has the women over to see our huge house with 16 bathrooms filled with thrones. I've had people compare it to Monte Carlo or a hotel in France. Inspiring Jackie to write an article about spoiled children, which is hilarious, and launches a feud between the two. Her running theme this season is Jennifer spoiling her children, but she doesn't care. She also feels the tension between wanting to honor the old school traditions from her Turkish heritage while still being a modern woman who has a life outside of her husband and children. Her and Margaret's feud goes really far when the women go to Cabo and Jennifer insults the jewelry Margaret got for Teresa. And you know what? It's ugly. Sorry, Teresa. Leading ultimately to Marge accusing Jennifer's husband of having an affair. If you want a full play-by-play -play of this trip, it's featured in part one of my cash trips video. This fight gets really nasty and sours Teresa on Margaret, solidifying the alliances that have dominated Jersey in recent years. Ultimately, I thought Jennifer was such a great addition. She's funny and shamelessly gaudy with her wealth. She says whatever's on her mind, mostly trying to get a laugh, though not everyone finds her funny. She's also not afraid to show all parts of herself. Even though she's a princess, she doesn't act prim and proper and has a silliness that's light and fun to watch. She knows how to make good TV, notably when she weaponizes gift giving. Why'd she get a knife and I did it? It's actually called a hunchad, which is an ancient Turkish dagger that people use when they want to stab people in the back. 
If I got to pick a housewife to go out partying with, Jennifer would be right near the top of my list. So let's bring back in Jackie and talk about how the two of them totally changed Jersey. In the seasons prior to this, Teresa had been mostly given a break and everyone had been sucking up to her. Jackie changed this, empowering Melissa to stand up against her, reinvigorating their feud. The two naturally gravitated to Margaret, who really has the chops to hold her own, and the three became a loyal trio. Jennifer was firmly Team Tree. Teresa saw her sense of humor for what it was and felt protective when Margaret was going too far below the belt. It was really Danielle, who at the time was super close with Teresa and had had a major falling out with Margaret, who made the moves to scoop up Jennifer and keep her on their side, but I think it's where Jennifer wanted to be. Having this split house dynamic with fights between the women within these alliances helped foster a really solid outline for many seasons. Rumor has it things may be shifting in Jersey, so we'll have to wait and see how things shake out next season. All in all, I thought both Jackie and Jennifer were such fantastic additions. They both brought a unique vibe to the franchise and breathed new life into the show, keeping it going for many years with the core structure they helped create. Let's move on and talk about Candace Dillard Bassett, who joined the Ladies of Potomac in Season 3. She was brought on by Ashley Darby, as the two had known each other from the pageant world. I competed for Miss America, which is now almost a 100-year-old tradition, so pretty iconic. And Candace, she was in some off-brand pageant. She right away hits it off with Monique, having a lot in common. We see the three younger cast members hanging out a lot early on, almost as if an alliance of youngs was budding, though it wouldn't last, of course. Candace has kind of a slow trickle-in introduction, not even meeting Giselle until a few episodes had passed in the season. A theme in her first season was that a lot of the other women didn't really take her seriously. Robin met her early on and didn't even remember meeting her, and Giselle can't get past Candace's comments on her husband, that is her soon-to-be husband's, nether regions. The tip is a little pink, but the shaft is brown. I don't believe it. <laughs> she also has major little sister energy. She's petite and has a very youthful look, but it's made worse by the fact that she's still very much under her mother Dorothy's thumb. Her mom pays half of the mortgage on her home and has her own wing in it. I call it the diva den. Visiting often. She's also right in the thick of wedding planning, one of her personal storylines this season, and her mother is very much involved in this to the point of being overbearing. She's also paying for much of the wedding, giving the ladies further ammo against Candace, with Giselle and Charisse leading the charge. At first, Candace plays ball, knowing that a little bit of hazing is par for the course. She's a fan of the show. But she reaches her breaking point when the ladies take a trip to Nima Colon. On the bus, Cherie starts jabbing, and when Candace lightly jabs back, It was a shady bitch moment. But did, did wait, 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 what? what? Cherise clutches her pearls, and Candace shows the other ladies what we know full well now, which is that she's got a tongue made of razors. Geriatric granny, don't talk to me. All right, all right. All right. All of the ladies, including her allies Monique, Ashley, and Karen, who's really taken to Candace, tell her that she went too far. This is kind of wild given that other talking points this season were the hugris tax issues, alleged affairs by Monique, Karen, and Michael Darby, and Monique driving drunk and potentially being an alcoholic, but whatever, I guess Candace being mean supersedes that. This trip gets Candace fully involved in the drama and brings her in as a major player. She had an advantage in that Karen, Robin, and even Monique at the time, rest in peace, really liked her so she wasn't ostracized. She also had personal storylines galore. She was running a hair business with her sister, dealing with her mom and all of this. Her mother's really interesting. She's one of the most talked about moms on all of Bravo, and we see where Candace gets her sharp tongue from, but we do see her react well when Candace and Chris tell her about Chris's oldest son. I'm planning to eventually do a video on the mothers of Bravo, so I'll save all of my thoughts for that. But along with the hair business, we see her planning her wedding, dealing with the back and forth between her mom and dad, and bickering with Chris about the planning. The dynamic in their relationship is really interesting. She came from a very upper middle class country club type of lifestyle as the daughter of a doctor and a therapist, whereas Chris grew up not having as much. Candace reads as very spoiled and princessy, whereas he reads a little more take what you get and this causes tensions in their relationship. We see the remnants of a blowout fight they had, which nearly spelled the end of their relationship. At first being told it resulted from her asking him to hold her purse and him calling her a princess, to which she had this to say to him. You're a coward and a clone of your deadbeat father, and you can off and get the out of my life. But we later find out at the reunion there was a little more to the story. What, what he, he actually said? said to me was, don't let this show go to your head because you ain't shit. We also see throughout the season that she's a natural performer and sings hello rather than says it at every opportunity she gets. Hello. Even though Candace would have way crazier seasons after this, I think this was a strong debut and she did a great job in graining herself in the group. 
Candace seems to be one of the most polarizing housewives across all of the franchises, but it's hard to deny she knows how to deliver a show and is part of making Potomac into the top tier franchise it is today. So let's move over to Beverly Hills and talk about Miss Lisa Rinna, who joined the cast in season five. Apparently, she'd been wanting to join the show since season one. We see her make a cameo on The Real Housewives of New York. Here she is in the background of a fashion show scene where Bethany is telling Luann off. I don't like you, I don't trust you, and I think you're a snake. Apparently, Andy was worried that the show would seem fake if he had actresses on, and I guess enough years had passed since the Richard sisters had acted, so Rena was initially rejected. After the fever dream that was season four... Have I practiced dark? I have practiced dark, but now... I practice light, and that's all I practice because I have children. I would never go to the dark side. Not again. I guess the network decided that the time was right for actresses to join, and she and Eileen Davidson were added to the cast. I came to the show late and was binge-watching the shows on Hulu, and I was super eager to get to Rena's debut. I don't really know why. I'd seen her in a guest spot on Community, where she played a housewife, and on Veronica Mars, where she played the wife of Harry Hamlin, and I guess that was enough for me to pre-stand her. I think there's a glimmer of marketing genius in the way she styles her hair and with her big lips. It makes her instantly recognizable, and even if you don't know anything about her, you remember her very distinctive look. She joins knowing most of the women, at least to some degree. She and Kyle talk about knowing each other from having their kids in Kitty Kabbalah class growing up. Right off the bat, we see that she's super self-deprecating and has a hustle that doesn't get in the way of any sense of pride she may have about herself. I'll do anything to make a buck. I don't say no very much, I say yes. LVP was on the heels of her takedown the previous season, and since she was on the outs with most of the cast, she was primed to take Rena in. We see them get on really well that first season. They're really funny together. She's also solidly aligned with Eileen. They came on as kind of a pair and grew really close over their time on the show, but I got the vibe that they were more of acquaintances pre-show. Early on, Brenna was just such a fun character. We see her with her daughter and her husband, the always referenced in full name Harry Hamlin, of whom she's very proud. She's also very into celebrity. She name drops at the drop of a hat, even if it means giving a shout out to the man who her husband's ex-wife cheated on him with. And then Michael Bolton looked at me and he said, you are so welcome. We also see her going on radio shows and guesting on Access Hollywood. We see her shooting a movie with Penn and Teller where she plays herself. It's kind of cool to see. Even though the Richards girls had been actresses as children, they were more focused on their roles as mothers in those early years, so it was really with Rena and Eileen that we got to see that star side of Los Angeles, which we'd see again later with Denise and Garcelle. She's not super into the drama until Eileen decides to host a poker night. She rides up with Kim Richards, who had been sober for a few years, but seems a bit off. I am just... Henri. Rena asks her point blank if she's been drinking, and they have the strangest exchange. You're disgusting. Yeah. You're smart. You're f***ing. What are you doing here now? You're f***ing. You're disgusting. Exactly. Rena seems to not know if this is a bit or if Kim's serious. It's bizarre. When they arrive and the poker tournament gets going, Kim and Brandy are acting kind of strange and hostile and begin majorly fighting with Kyle. It's clear to everyone that Kim is not sober, and she later admits that she'd taken a pain pill that had made her act the way she did. Rena and Eileen are horrified at her behavior and the severity in the fight between Kim and Kyle, and this only gets worse when Kyle hosts her version of a girls and gays, all-white, seafood soiree, never forget party, and the fight between Kim and Brandy and Kyle continues. At this, she declares Kim an addict, and both her and Eileen get hyperfixated on it. I'm a big Kim Richards fan, so my natural instinct is to side with her, but since I was watching this season focused on Rena, I started to see her point of view a bit better. First off, the housewife's world is weird. It's not normal to see fighting of this magnitude, and with the river running so deep between Kyle and Kim, this fight must have been absolutely bonkers to witness for a rookie. Rena also had a very intimate relationship with addiction, having lost her older sister as a child to it, as well as dealing with her husband Harry Hamlin's own struggles. And Kim was acting very bizarrely and hostily, and it was affecting her and people she'd grown to care about. I think it was natural she sided with Kyle, as the two were closer and she could relate more to the caregiver than to the person with the addiction. I can totally see why Rena would be concerned, as Kim was acting totally inappropriately, but I also don't think it was Rena's job to keep her accountable, as the two didn't really know each other that well. Kim should have been held accountable for her actions, but the onus wasn't on Lisa Rinna to do so, and it came off as interfering in something she really had no business being a part of. It seems like a lot of people feel the need to interfere in the Richard sisters' dynamics, and Rinna is the biggest offender of this. I think Rinna struggles to put herself in someone else's emotional shoes, and during this conflict, she failed to realize that Kim was past her breaking point on the subject. She'd faced a lot of humiliation regarding her sobriety on this show, and Rinna wasn't reaching someone who was open to her questioning about if she had a sponsor. 
Still, I don't think she was trying to instigate conflict with Kim about this, but rather genuinely concerned about her, and she couldn't read Kim's cues well enough to know to back off or else. This brings us to the Amsterdam trip, where Kim asked Rena straight up to drop the subject, yet she still brought it up at their first dinner. To be fair, Yolanda had asked the group to open up to each other, and Rena started off talking about her own experience, but she majorly misread the room when she pivoted it to Kim. Kim doesn't react well. If you want the full breakdown, watch the Cash Trips Part 2 video, I'll link it below, but the short version is Kim launches a nuclear attack on Rena, Eileen, and Kyle, making vague accusations about Harry Hamlin. And so before let's talk three about the years. husband. <laughs> oh, wait, excuse me. Did you just say let's, let's talk about not, the husband? Let's not talk about what you don't want to help. Causing Rinna to lunge at her and attempt to choke her and smash her wine glass. It's insane. For the rest of the trip, Rinna seems shell-shocked. She makes up with Kim in the two attempt to make nice, but it's clear Rinna is just totally freaked out and the drama shifts to Brandy versus everyone. Back in LA, Brandy and Rinna have a great conversation about Kim and their concern for her. When Kyle learns about this, she tells Kim that Brandy and Rinna want to have an intervention for her. When Kim asks about this at the finale party, Rinna skirts it away as it was a good conversation with Kim's best interest at heart. She also doesn't want to further anger Kim as now she is able to read Kim's stop sign full and well. This upsets Kyle and Eileen as they feel that she's not being open and honest, but I think Rena was fully in survival mode and just wanted to keep the peace. We find out at the reunion that this didn't last long and Rena sent Kim a slew of threatening text messages. Be very careful or I will f you up. You be nice to your sister. You believe her and stop telling lies in that order. But Kim stopped being a full-time cast member after this season, so we'd only see sparks of this feud flare up here and there, mostly in season seven when she claimed Kim was close to death. I do not ever remember saying that. All in all, Rena was just fantastic this season. I know nearly everyone is soured on her at the point I'm writing this as season 12 wraps up, but I found myself remembering why Rena is such a great housewife while watching this back. I think her and Eileen's inclusion gave the show such a star power. Normally when famous women join, they are just wanting to get their names out there and let us down in that their personalities aren't nearly as fierce as some of the characters they've played. It's like they want to show us how normal and grounded they are, which is kind of a letdown for the audience. Rita wasn't like this at all. She's messy and chaotic and not afraid to say exactly what's on her mind and often doesn't seem to have the long-term vision needed to see the ramifications of her actions. She's not afraid to do the dirty work and call people out, which creates drama on the show, but has really made her into an unpopular villain as she's gone after many fan favorites, running several of them off the show. No matter what your feelings are on Rinna, you can't deny that she's become a central part of Beverly Hills and had a very flashy rookie season. And last, let's head to New York City and discuss Aviva, who I was surprised to see was the most mentioned person left off of season one, but upon reviewing, y'all were 100% right. Aviva was a force this season. So this season came off of the largest axing at the time in Bravo history after Queen Alex McCord, Jill Zarin, and Kelly Ben Simone were given the chop. Oh, and Cindy Barshop. Aviva joined alongside Carol Radziwell and Heather Holly Thompson to give the show a fresh feel, and boy did they ever. Aviva came in set up for success in every way. She was sophisticated, well-educated, tall, gorgeous. All of the women took to her right away. She was connected to the group, especially through her ex-husband Harry Dubin, who had dated both Sonia and Luann, so there was plenty to talk about. Sonia was a little wary due to the Dubin connection, but Aviva quickly won her over. The only person she weirded out of it was Carol, as Aviva was a huge fan of her book, but Carol made do. What's not to love about Aviva? She's a blonde bombshell, and she's my super fan. It doesn't take long before some cracks begin to show, and we see that she's very neurotic. She opens up about an accident in her childhood that took one of her legs and has left her with panic disorder. Everything scares her. She's a regular Chucky Finster. She's concerned when Ramona says her heart is beating out of her chest after a confrontation with Luann. Wasn't really sure if she was having a heart attack or if I should have called 911 or or what happened. She's scared to go in elevators. She freaks out when the fire alarm goes off at a party. Oh my God, the Empire State Building is in flames and we're all gonna die of smoke inhalation. Even when it prompts Sonia to suggest they have a fireman party. Doing a fireman's event you're gonna be invited to. Okay, right. At first, it's kind of charming and quirky. The ladies are happy to hold her hand in the elevator, but it doesn't take too long before the other ladies realize just how debilitating it is and start to get annoyed. She needs her husband read with her at all times, and the Roni ladies are just not into having the husbands around all that often. But Aviva's story with her leg is very heart-wrenching, and she's very open and vulnerable when talking about it. Ramona is captivated by her prosthetic. Do you wear shoes. sandals? I can do wear... Do you have fake toes? I do. I have fake toes, fake toenails, fake moles. Are you serious? I have veins in my leg. I get pedicures. On both feet? On both feet, yeah. She also really connects with Heather on it, as Heather's son has some medical issues of his own. 
She doesn't get involved in the drama early on, but is more than happy to commentate on it. One of the biggest conflicts at the beginning of this season is Ramona versus Heather when the two accuse each other of talking over the other. Ramona is also insensitive about the death of Heather's father, and the two really don't mesh. So Heather doesn't invite Ramona on a trip to London. Aviva doesn't think it's right to leave just Ramona out, but plays both sides in the conflict. She gets really close to Ramona until she invites her and Mario to join her and Reed in Miami. When Sonia joins them, Ramona ditches Aviva and spends all of her time with Sonia, blatantly leaving Aviva out. This is our thing. Oh, Sonia, okay. our thing. Oh, I'm not included? No. Oh. I'm sorry. Okay. Ramona is also very fixated on the leg, which annoys Aviva. You, you can't wet, wet your leg. <laughs> I mean, how many legs do you have? <laughs> to make matters worse, Aviva introduces her dad into the mix, and he's very sexual. Well, I could give you your first squirting <laughs> orgasm. Oh my God. <laughs> she's eager to set him up with Sonia, but he's so forward, it freaks even her out. It's the kind of thing that's funny at first, but the joke wears and wears, and it just gets awkward. Things really take a turn in her relationship with Ramonia when she hosts a Soul Cycle charity event to raise money for a boy to get running legs, and the two don't show up. Aviva, I would have scared so... the kids. My face was so freaking red. The photographers would have said, who is she? My face was on fire, I didn't okay? know it. When a cast trip to St. Bart's is proposed, Aviva hems and haws because she's afraid of planes. She ultimately decides to go and arrives a few days into the trip with Reed and Toe. And Ramonia are not having it. They think the dynamic will change with Reed there, and when Aviva confronts them about it... Oh, I'm asking you a question. You don't have anything negative to say about me being here, do you? It doesn't go well for them. My husband. But goes great for us viewers. You're both white trash, quite frankly. Ramona and Sonia get really fixated on this white trash comment, and despite a brief makeup, they all fight again and again. Heather's also over Aviva at this point because she feels that Aviva tends to make everything about her and also feels that the dynamic shifted when Reed arrived. Back in New York, Aviva is totally obsessed with the St. Bart's trip and her fight with Ramona. Heather and Carol just want her to talk about anything else. Carol tries a unique diversion. I started smoking. Are you serious? Ramona and Aviva meet up to talk things out, and it's so unhinged. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. But I did know Who's driving? I know it. Who's you know driving it? on the island? Not, you are crazy. It's a saying. I am not responsible. Ramona, it's a saying. It's a metaphor. Metaphor. M-E-T-A-P-H-O-R. No, you okay. drive. You know what? Friends Having you around drives me to have diarrhea. You upset my stomach. Yeah. So after accusing her of being an insecure alcoholic enabler, Ramona is done with Aviva and hosts a charity event on the 90th floor of a building and hopes that Aviva will be too scared to attend. She's right, but Aviva sends her father in her place, who proceeds to get in an altercation of his own with Ramona. They never really reach a good resolution, even at the reunion, which is a shame as they started the season off so close. All in all, Aviva was just a spectacle this season. She came in as the it girl primed to shine and steal the center apple spot, but she isolated nearly every cast member as the season progressed. All of the women really wanted to like her, but one by one she turned all of them against her, building on that the next season. Still, watching the season back really gave me a new appreciation for Aviva, and I hope to see her pop up on the Legacy show. She's majorly underrated. So that's my look into five more iconic rookie seasons. Please let me know who you want to see featured in the next installment. Definitely subscribe to the channel if you want to see more videos diving into The Real Housewives, and give the video a thumbs up so the algorithm can do its thing. If you want to connect on social media, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram under at DeeplySuperFish. I'll link them below. But I'll look forward to seeing you all in the next video. Bye!